Uh, I, I heard we are we're around 300 people. Uh, that is terrible. We are 300 people more than I am comfortable around. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but you're at, least, you're at least kind enough to laugh every time I do something slightly funny, so thanks. Um, so the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, Erlang is a wonderful ecosystem. Uh, you can implement lots of common functionalities that many systems need uh, using just built-in tools and guarantees that Erlang provides. For example, you have ETS if you want an in-memory uh, storage. We have, you have Mnesia if you want a distributed database. You have message passing built-in and it works from uh, across different processes living on different nodes. So these are uh, components that are really nice to build uh, systems, especially distributed systems. Um, the problem is that uh, Erlang may not be the only language that you're using in your system. So you may have uh, other languages. Uh, so for example, if you have a service-oriented architecture, uh, Erlang may not be the only language. Some services may be written in other languages. Uh, this means that you can communicate with uh, er between Erlang services and other services using Erlang built-in tools anymore, right? So you need to generalize the tools if you want to communicate between the services. So for example, you may want to use a key value store such as Redis or relational database or a message queue such as uh, RabbitMQ um, to communicate and to share data between these uh, services. Um, using these external tools though means that uh, there is uh, no guarantee, like there are no more uh, guarantees from Erlang. Uh, there, there are no more built-in solutions from Erlang. So you need to do more work yourself to, work, to, to make these components work with Erlang. Uh, so we, you, we need to, uh, you need to make Erlang talk to the outside world uh, and connect to the out, out, outside world, the world outside the virtual machine. The problem is that the outside world is really scary. So like a lot of bad things can happen and will happen. Uh, so no, nodes will go down and uh, services will go down and uh, the network is, will go down. The net network is really terrible as a concept, I mean, and uh, so it's, uh, it's gonna be bad. So you want a way to, to deal with it, uh, keeping you sane, possibly. And um, so this is what I'm gonna talk in, the, in this talk, which is uh, how to build uh, connections to the, these external services that uh, don't drive you insane, basically. So my, my name is Andrea. Uh, that is my username. Uh, I uh, started working with Elixir, I don't remember when, but uh, Elixir has, a, has had a really uh, huge impact on my life. So it got, it got me my first few jobs and it made me move countries. So I, I'm from Italy, but I'm living in Gothenburg. Uh, that is Sweden, of course. I couldn't find any vector map, so I, I, drew, <laughs> I drew one. It's remarkably accurate. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm living there, yes. The low part of the... Uh, <clears throat> and I work there at uh, Football Addicts, which is this nice sponsor over here. And uh, I work there full time. Um, and. Uh, it's really nice, we're kind of hiring, so uh, don't be shy. Um, so let's do a couple of shows of hands to test that everything works, because we need to, I will need to know the audience a little bit. Um, so first, like, set up tests, so who's able to raise a hand? <laughs> Many people are not raising a hand, I, I'm very sorry. Uh, so who would like to not raise their hands now? <laughs> this is tricky. You raised it, <laughs> it doesn't count. So, all right. Um, so we'll, we'll um, so who knows what a joint server is and how it works? This is the real show of hands, great. And uh, who knows how TCP roughly works? So this is a great audience, uh, all right. Uh, we're going to make some assumptions um, to make everything easier. One is that we'll use only TCP to connect to other services because we'll have more concrete examples this way. And it's uh, easier to reason about, I think. But this, most of these example apply to, with connecting uh, in other ways. So UDP or even ports for uh, uh, the most part, I think. And um, we're going to assume 
that the service we want to connect to uh, follows a request response cycle. So it follows, uh, so you just issue a request and it gives you back a response. This is not, uh, very, uh, this is not very general, of course, but uh, it will make examples so much uh, more concrete, but we'll still present the concepts very clearly, I think. And the last assumptions we're gonna make, we're gonna make this very, very not general and talk about just Redis for now. So how to connect to Redis, because it's by far what I know best, because I wrote Redix, which is the uh, Erlang, uh, sorry, Elixir driver for uh, Redis. And um, so this is by far what I know best, but I mean, it will work with anything else. The, the concepts I will talk about will work with anything else, but it's easier for me. So. Um, there's a very silly way to, to communicate with an external service. So in the case of Redis, uh, we want to just a way to issue a command to Redis, right? So you want to issue a command and get back a response from Redis. And uh, the very silly way is just, you connect every time you want to uh, issue a command. So you create a socket, uh, a TCP socket, and you connect to the Redis server. You send the encoded data to the Redis server as a, as a binary, of course. Uh, you receive the response, uh, wait for the response from the server, um, close the socket and return the data to the client, to the caller, sorry. Uh, so this is a very silly way to do this and uh, it works. I mean, uh, it gets the job done, but it's uh, terrible because opening new connections is really expensive, especially in most uh, cases. For, for example, TCP is, is really expensive to set up a TCP connection because you have uh, more network calls, you have uh, to allocate resources. So for example, Redis will have to allocate resources for the client that is connecting. So it's not uh, an expensive operation and, and often uh, the cost of just establishing the connection will be higher than the cost of actually uh, sending the, the commands and receiving the response. So you don't want to do this every time you want to uh, initiate, uh, to issue a command on Redis. So the next uh, natural step is you want to keep the, the socket, open socket in a gen server, right? So you want to uh, um, encapsulate this socket in a gen server and you want to leave it with the, to, you want it to leave with the gen server. So you want to open it uh, when you initialize the gen server, you want to close it when you terminate the gen server. Um, so it's, it works really well, and you all, we will keep the connection open, the socket open for the whole life of the gen server. Uh, so how do you take advantage of the socket uh, keep kept in the gen server state? So I think there are two good ways to do this. Uh, one is the I refer to as a blocking way, and one I refer to as a non-blocking way. We'll see later what this means, so let's just uh, look at them. So the blocking ways, block, blocking way, sorry. Um, what I mean by blocking way is now we have the gen server and it has the socket in its state, and clients want to uh, use that socket to talk to Redis. So what will happen is we can uh, basically check out the socket from the gen server. So the, a client can ask the, the gen server for the socket, uh, then use the socket to, to send data to Redis and receive data, uh, and then give the socket back to the gen server. So the gen server basically only acts as a, a container for this socket. It won't do anything to, the, to this socket or, or through this socket. It will just hand it to clients uh, that ask for it. Uh, and th this is the pseudo code, but it's like this is works. This works. It's it's a very simple uh, implementation. It will just check out the socket then do the sending and receiving stuff and check the socket back in into the gen server state. Uh, the problem happens now when you want to use this, gen, this socket for multiple Elixir processes, because you can't right now, because if one process checks the socket out of the gen server, then it will, if another process checks that socket out, then they will conflict on the data that they're sending through the socket and the response, responses that they're getting back. So what you, what you have, I think you have two solutions to handle this. So the first solution is if the, a, a client uh, checks the socket out of the gen server and then another client asks for the socket, you just reply error checked out. So you just don't check out the socket to other processes. You only check out the so socket to one process uh, at a time. And uh, this, of course, is very limiting because you, you only can, like your connection to Redis can only uh, handle one client at a time. 
uh, but it works. And the other way is if to use a, a queue of clients that want the socket. So when a client asks for the socket, uh, if the socket is already checked out, the gen server will put this client in a queue. And then next time the socket is available, we will give it to the next client in the queue. So it will just implement a kind of a queuing uh, system. And it, this is kind of works, and it works for multiple um, processes talking to the same gen server, because it will be just queued. Uh, and it kind of works with Redis in particular, actually, because Redis is single-threaded, so it will process, process requests one at a time, and it re will reply uh, to one request at a time. So it's, uh, it will not, you will not lose too much by doing this. Um, you kind of re-implement the logic that is in Red for handling, handling clients in Redis in your gen server. But both of these approaches, uh, the first one, uh, it, it's, it's mandatory, and the second one is for performance. You probably want to have some kind of pooling uh, to handle this. So you want to have, by pooling, I mean you want to have a pool of gen servers connected to Redis, and you want to, when you want to, when you want a socket to do operations with, with Redis, you will first check out the gen server from the pool, then use the, that gen server socket, and then check the socket back in the pool. And this works fine because, especially with the uh, first method of the uh, replying with an error when the socket is checked out because now only one client at a time will uh, talk to the gen server. It will have the exclusive on the gen server, so it will, be, uh, it will work fine. Um, but uh, let's see the other way then. So we, we, that was the first way to take advantage of keeping the uh, sockets in the gen server's um, state. So the other way is what I call non-blocking way. And uh, so until now, we used the socket in a, what is called it's called passive mode. Uh, so as you remember, we um, manually uh, actively fetched the data from the socket using gen TCP receive. So when we were ready to handle new data from the socket, we will just ask the socket for new data and block until the, the socket will give, give data back to us. Uh, this, this is called passive mode, uh, kind of. And, um, there's an other mode which is active mode for gen TCP socket, uh, which is, means that you will not have to ask the socket for data uh, anymore, but the socket will send you data uh, as an Elixir message, so basically asynchronously. So what you just send, uh, you just use the socket to send data, and then uh, the socket will send you back the data uh, the response uh, as an Elixir message. And um, it will send them back to the controlling process of the socket, which is just the, by default the process that started the socket. Uh, but it makes things more asynchronous, let's, let's say. We can handle the data when we're ready to, but the data is already there in the, mess, in the mailbox of the process. Uh, and we can combine this with no reply from gen server, because right now when we were calling the gen server to do stuff, we were using gen server .call, which is blocking for the client, right? So the, right now we were, I mean, it, it, when checking out the socket, for example, we were, of course, waiting for a reply in the client. So what we can do is return no reply from the handle of call in the gen server, uh, and uh, the client will keep waiting for the res response, so we will keep blocking uh, for a response, but the gen server can keep doing its work, right? And if we combine this with gen server .reply, which is a manual way, to reply to pending requests, pending calls, basically. So if you have a gen server call, uh, you can reply to that call with gen server reply manually. Uh, so if, and, and of course the call will return and it will not block anymore. So if you combine these three, so the active sockets and the returning no reply from the uh, handle call, so keep, keep, keep working after sending the data through Red, to Redis, uh, and uh, then using ma reply manually, uh, you have a nice flow. So the flow is now is the gen server, the client asks the gen server to send a command to Redis. The gen server stores this client in a queue in its state and sends the command to Redis to, through the TCP socket. And then returns no reply and continues handling client requests, the gen server. Um, Redis at some point it will reply and the gen server will be notified with a message um, that contains the reply, and the gen server will just forward that reply to the next client in the queue. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, straightforward way, I think, to, to uh, reason. It's, 
like this is, this is the kind of drawing of what happens. You have a bunch of clients that ask the gen server to send commands to Redis. The gen server will send command to Redis uh, and keep sending them until a reply arrives. When a reply arrives and the gen server has time to look at the message uh, that is the response, then it will uh, take the next client, out, next client out of the internal queue and send the response to the client. So this is, performs pretty well uh, because you take advantage of the fact that TCP is full duplex. What it means is that TCP is a protocol that, that supports a pair of um, byte streams, uh, one flowing in, it, in each direction. Uh, so um, at, at, at the same time, I mean. So basically, what you take advantage of doing this uh, is that you send the data uh, to the TCP buffer of Redis, basically while your, like the TCP buffer of the gen server is getting filled at the same time, even if the gen server is not processing the message, but the data is still uh, arriving to the gen server and filling its TCP buffer, and it's much faster to take stuff out of the buffer than out of the um, remote server with gen TCP not received. So you take advantage of this bi-directional stream. And actually, it's, there is an uh, even more performant way to take advantage of uh, this, um, which is basically introducing a new uh, component, which is now the, the old gen server will now, will now call it the sender, and we, we will spawn a new gen server call, that we will call receiver. So when you spawn the sender, that's, the sender will spawn its, its own receiver. And now clients just talk to the sender and send commands to the sender, and the sender will actually send the commands to Redis uh, through the TCP sockets. Um, but Redis, the controlling process of the socket will be the receiver, so that Redis will reply to the receiver, not to the sender, and the receiver will just uh, process the data and send it back to the client. So the receiver is the one keeping the queue of clients now, and we can parallelize this way, the sending of data to Redis and receiving, not only on the TCP, actual TCP connection, but even on the like, program level. You can just, one is responsible for sending and it will not be blocked if there's a huge response coming, for example, and the other one is just responsible for receiving. So if many clients try to send comments, it will not block. <coughs> All right, so these are the two ways. I think that these are two nice ways to take advantage of this. And um, both have both pros and cons. Um, the blocking way as a pro that is that it copies less data. So as you know, when a process sends a message to another process in Elixir, the message gets copied, right? So if the gen, ser if the gen server acts as a middleman, so Redis re replies to the gen server and the gen server replies to the client, then when the gen server replies to the client, it will send a message to the client to reply to it. And then the data that, that Redis return will be copied over to the client. So there's more data copying. If you just take the sockets out of the gen server, the socket, is, the socket address is the only thing that will be copied. You will just, the client will directly work with the socket. So the data will flow directly from Redis to the, your uh, client. So it will be less data copying. And you can do encoding and decoding on the client. This is something you can do with an unblocking version as well sometimes, but sometimes you can't because the decoding the data that comes requires some kind of state, for example. So this, uh, uh, or some kind of uh, knowledge of the request. Uh, so you, sometimes you have to do this in the server. There's no way to do this in the client. Uh, so if, if you're doing, I mean, if you're doing uh, non-blocking, so if re responses to many requests are coming to the gen server, but if you're checking out the socket and working, you're on, the only process working uh, with uh, that socket uh, at, at a moment, then it will be just your socket. So decoding and encoding will be, can be done in the client safely. Um, but there are cons as well. So one is that this approach needs pooling, as we discussed, probably needs pooling, otherwise it will not perform very well. Uh, and it doesn't use full, the full duplex thing about TCP. So it will only either send or receive messages. It will not do these operations at the same time. Um, and the pros and cons of the other way are actually uh, the same, the reverse. Uh, just, uh, you copy more data, yes, but, uh, and you have to encode and encode the server sometimes, but you don't need pooling. You can use just a single connection you, and you take advantage of the full uh, duplex thing about TCP. And when I say don't, uh, you don't need pooling, a small parenthesis, we're using Redis in a production 
with Radix, which has this exact architecture with uh, two sender and receiver processes. And we're using this in production, we're using just one Radix process in the whole system. And uh, it, it performs nice. It's, it's not, uh, we, we don't have a huge amount of requests going through it. But if you do have a, a huge amount of requests going through it, through it you can still pull the non-blocking version as well. You have, you can, and maybe you can, instead of giving each uh, gen server in the pool to a client, you can maybe give the gen server in the pool to a bunch of clients. So you still take advantage of the full duplex and being uh, concurrent, but you can handle uh, you more, more load. So we talked about uh, how to connect and to talk to external services. Um, but the problem is that, as I said earlier, the outside world is scary and uh, connections suck and uh, networks suck, computers suck. So it's pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so uh, if you don't want to suck as well, you need to handle the fact that things may go down. So you need to be resilient and, and fault tolerant, right? So uh, how are you feeling? I, I feel like, oops, I'm going and saying a lot of things. Too many things? All right, it's good, okay, thanks. Uh, all right, so, so you have this connection from the gen server to Redis, uh, and the connection goes down. It can go down because there's a net split, it can go down because the server, Redis server goes down, the Redis machine goes down, uh, the city where the Redis machine is in explodes. Uh, aliens, you can really, look, I could talk for 20 minutes about all the things that can happen. But like, they will happen at some point for some reason. Uh, but luckily you get um, notified some way of these errors by Gen TCP at least. Uh, you get some kind of TCP closed message or TCP error message. And uh, so you can react to these events. So the, the semantics of what message you get and how do you get it are kind of different between active and passive mode, but let's, let's go over that for a moment. But uh, you, you're notified that this connection uh, has gone down. So you can make this, your connection self-healing, right? So you can react to these events by maybe backing off for a little while, so before reconnecting or maybe not, and then trying to reconnect. Um, and while you're in the back off period, you can just say to clients, we're, we're disconnected, we're not connected yet, and it's the responsibility of clients to handle this. Um, they can error out or they can handle this nicely. It's, and this is very easy to implement with, uh, there's a package uh, on X called Connection by James Fish, which I really feel like should call Gen Connection, because it's very generic. Um, and it's basically a uh, text gen server and extends it with a bunch of callbacks, uh, additional callbacks and re return values. Um, so it's a superset of Gen Server. It supports all the callbacks that Gen, ser Gen Server um, defines. And uh, it will define two additional callbacks, which are connect and disconnect. They are pretty self-explanatory. So the first will be called to connect to the resource, and the second will be called to disconnect from the resource. It's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. And uh, it will provide a couple of new return values that you can return from a bunch of these callbacks uh, that are back off and disconnect. So when you return back off from one of these callbacks, then connect and you, you, give, you return back off uh, alongside a timeout. Then after you return back off, uh, the gen server will call the connection, sorry, will call the gen connection, sorry, will call connect after uh, the timeout you give it. Um, so it's useful to just do back off. Um, and then if you return disconnect uh, with a reason uh, from the, one of these uh, callbacks, then disconnect will be called right away. Um, and it will just, you can disconnect and clean up resources and whatever you want to do. And this, this lends itself to a pretty nice pattern, which is you get a TCP error in handle info if you're connected to uh, if you're a gen server connected to a socket right, and there's an error, you get this error in handle info. So you react to it by returning disconnect from handle info. And if you return disconnect from handle info, uh, disconnect will be called. In disconnect now, you close the socket and then you return back off so that it will try to reconnect after a given timeout. So basically you get notified of the error, you disconnect and you back off and you get notified uh, again after a timeout period. And uh, 
in connect. If you connect, then good. If you don't connect, you just return back off and you keep returning back off until you're able to connect. Um, and this brings to a very interesting uh, debate, in my opinion, which is should I connect synchronously or should I connect asynchronously? Uh, what I mean is that when you call gen server, does start link and you start a gen server, the PID of the gen server will only be returned when init finishes, right? So if, uh, if you want to con connect synchronously, what, what I say is you connect inside init so that you only get back the PID from the new gen server if you manage to connect, so if you manage to establish the connection. Um, but the alternative is, so this may take a while to initiate, of course, but then you'll have the connection available and, and it's okay, but the alternative is, is Alternative is you call start link, and then init gets called, and from init, you just return the connect tuple and, and return right away. And what this means is it means that uh, co connection, the library, will call connect right away. So you will call start link, then init will get run, and it will return a PID right away because the actual uh, process is started and it's working. Then the connection, uh, happens later. So it happens as the first thing, of course, because you, you want to have this connection available, but it happens in the gen server and the caller doesn't have to wait uh, for the gen server to start, to initiate the connection in order for the gen server to start. And uh, this works uh, pretty nicely. And so when do you use synchronous connection and when do you use a synchronous connection? So the idea is that if your application heavily depends on uh, the connection being, being available, you maybe want to start the connection synchronously because you want to be sure that if the gen server return, then the connection is available. Um, so when to use a sync then? Like if your code is prepared to handle, um, for example, errors in, in the connection, so connection not being available or connection drops, if it's prepared to handle that, then you can use it in a synchronous connection, right? Because connecting the first time will be ju just the same as connecting, uh, late, uh, disconnecting later on if you fail to connect on the first time. So if you're prepared to handle this, you will be prepared to handle this even if, if, if the gen server never manages to connect. So this, this can work fine. And this is a very, very interesting debate, in my opinion, because you get to talk about, especially if you're putting this stuff, this gen servers, in a super, uh, supervisor, which is something that you usually want to do. So do you want your application to start only when all resources are available and, and we are connected to all of them? Or do you want your application to start and then if the resources are available, good, otherwise your application will be able to handle, handle this? I, th I say that most of the time it's better to use a sync because your application should still be uh, ready to handle failures because there will be failures because networks suck. So it's uh, it's like there will be these failures. So it, it's better to it's good to be able to handle them. And if you're be ab if you're able to handle them, you're able to handle the fact that you never managed to connect as well. So uh, there's a quote from Erlang in Anger from Fred Ebert which says that by moving from synchronous connection to asynchronous connection you now allow initialization, initializations of gen servers with fewer guarantees. So now, now you, the guarantees are not the connection is available. So when you get a PID back, the guarantee is not anymore the connection is available. Now the guarantee is the connection manager, which is the gen server, is available. So the process is alive and available. It's doing its right thing. It's not erroring out in any way. It's, it's doing its thing. But the connection, actual connection is not available or maybe available, but we don't care because the guarantee right now is that the connection manager is available. And this is a simpler guarantee. So it's easier to deal with, I think. Um, yes, and uh, so we talked about connecting to other um, things outside the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, we, got, we talked about talking to these components outside of the Erlang virtual machine. We talked about how to, handle, how to take advantage of concurrency. So for example, by uh, splitting sender and receiver, you're taking advantage of concurrency there because you do things in parallel now instead of sequentially. And we talk about how to be resilient. Um, so how to handle failures in the connection, how to handle failures uh, in the network, and how to be self-healing as much as possible. And uh, that was surprisingly it. It's already over. Yeah. <laughs>
answer to all the three questions, which we have time for. So, who has a question? People can raise their hands. Yes, I have no doubt. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, in the, the current scenario, when the sender and receiver are yeah. two processes, um, how do you route back the response to the right client? You still, when, when the, um, let's go back to the, when the client sends, asks the sender to send a comment, the sender will first enqueue the client in the receiver, and then it will send the comment to Redis. So they still talk together. They, they talk, yes, yes. Okay. They're, they're very, they're linked processes. They, if uh, one of them dies, they both die. They're, they're, they can be seen as a singular unit. But uh, yeah, the sender will enqueue the thing in the client, yeah, uh, in the receiver, sorry. And then when Redis replies, the receiver will just take the next client out of the queue okay. and reply to that. I saw, could you pass the reference around in the Server? What do you mean? Sorry. Like, yeah, maybe not really something, some wrapper of. I'm not sure what you mean. Sorry. So what do you mean, like passing the reference? The reference of the. Of the call to the to the sender. Yeah. So the the, the when you call from the client to the sender, it's just a PID reference tuple. Yeah. So you have this ID of the call. You enqueue this. I, this call basically in the receiver, and when you get the response back from Redis, the receiver will take this call back and use genserver.reply passing this PID and uh, reference to identify the correct reply, the client's reply to. All right, is, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Uh, it's already bad. It's already really complicated to check out the the sender. The, just one process in a clean way, because for example, what happens if the if there's a timeout when when I have the socket and I d didn't check it back in? So it's already a mess. I think yes, you can try to to do this to take advantage of uh, full duplex, uh, but it's still for example, you still need pooling. Uh, you still not. It's not. I I can personally prefer the non-blocking method, but yes, but the this socket ownership method is, is uh, used. So Postgrex, for example, uh, uses this for, it uses the DB connection library, which this is kind of what it does. It checks out the socket to the clients and the clients will talk to, through the sockets and then check the socket back in. So it's definitely uh, a, an alternative. They're, they're not, no one is better than the other. They're just two alternatives, yes. If you mean a conversation still made of small request response cycles. Yeah, uh, not necessarily replying to what the server is saying back, but, but still you need to first invest the list and then send all of the responses back to the same one. You still, uh, so, this, the, so the, the resiliency part applies in the same way because the connection will still probably be in a, in a gen server because you don't want to initiate it many times, right? So the, that, that resiliency part can still work the same. Uh, as for the blocking, non-blocking thing, you may, you may use the blocking away and you just get the socket and send this data through the socket as a single client and then get, get the data back. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm, if I understood the question, question correctly. Uh, but there are, for example, one of the exam example is Redis pub sub, right? So this doesn't work as a, as a request response cycle because pub sub will send you messages when, when someone, someone publishes on, on the channel. So you don't have a request response, you just have responses coming in. And that is then, then the non-blocking way makes, makes sense because the gen server will, be, will, will receive all the messages and will route them privately to clients. So it's, uh, and, and the resiliency part will still be exactly the same. 
Radix has the exact same code for handling failures in the pub sub uh, connection and the regular connection, for example. So it's most of the, like a bunch of the things are, are pretty, pretty the same for all kinds of connections to outside uh, world, I would say. Like, even ports, like if you dis disconnect from a port or the program crashes, you can still apply the same like back off and uh, try to restart the program. So it's kind of the uh, same uh, philosophy, I guess. Well, you all know what to do then. Thank you very much.